Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Suman Karmuri. Today, I'm going to talk about CalDB serverless Lucene at petabyte scale. First of all, just a little bit about me. Uh, I currently work as a principal engineer working on observability at Airbnb. Uh, in the past, I've had a lot of uh, search journey experience, I would say. I was at Yahoo, and at Yahoo, I was working on a product called teachers.yahoo.com, which is kind of like a Pinterest for teachers. Uh, and uh, it used Vespa uh, as a backend, so that was the first time I got introduced to like search backends like Vespa and things like that. And uh, since then, I've worked on uh, various open source projects, and uh, I got into observability when I was at Twitter, and at Twitter, uh, I stood on Elasticsearch as their log search platform for them. And then we found that Elasticsearch didn't scale really well at Twitter. So we rewrote it with something uh, called Loglens. It was an internal project at the time. We didn't open source it. Uh, and then at Slack, uh, I did the same thing. I was working on uh, observability. I was running Elasticsearch. And then we replaced it with CalDB, which is the source for this talk. Uh, also, I've, I've been working on tracing. Uh, I've been like uh, in the tracing community from the start. Uh, I was the tech lead for Zipkin project at uh, Twitter. And uh, inside Zipkin, uh, we used Elasticsearch to store traces. I've also built like end-to-end -end tracing systems at Pinterest and Slack. And uh, for those systems, I've used Elasticsearch-based backends uh, to store traces and also like columnar stores. Uh, in general, uh, to summarize, I've worked uh, with search and elastic search like systems for a while now, and I love building observability, large scale observability systems and large scale distributed systems. So let, let's look at the motivation for my talk today. Uh, so the biggest motivation for my talk is log search doesn't really work well at uh, petabyte scale. If you have a petabyte of logs, uh, log search doesn't work well. You might say, hey, like, who has a petabyte of data, right? But if you think about it, uh, even if you're generating a very modest one terabyte of log volume a day, right, uh, and you have to retain that data for seven years because of SOX compliance, you have a petabyte data by the end of it. Similarly, if you are generating 10 terabytes a day, which is like uh, very small amounts of data, and you keep it for six months, you hit a terabyte. Uh, you hit a petabyte. Uh, if you are like a company like Slack, which is producing about hundreds of terabytes of data a day, you wait a week and you have a petabyte of data. So in all these companies, a petabyte of data is just uh, everyday scale. So uh, I've also done some research on, hey, like, is, uh, are these systems, are, is this issue with this elastic search just related to log search systems? Turns out the answer is not so much. Uh, for example, some of the companies uh, on here, some of them I worked at, some of them are public, uh, actually use MySQL or its variant, like a Vitesse or Aurora, as its uh, main database. That's where all the data stays, right? But if you want to pretty much search the data that's in the main database, nobody actually uses a stock search engine. Well, everybody started with that, but nobody uses it. What does everybody do? People who kind of like, manage to run existing systems or manage to suffer, they do. But people who actually uh, can build their own systems did. For example, Pinterest built their own system called Manus Slack Fort Solar to make uh, an in-house solar that actually works for us. Yelp uh, famously did NRT search. They gave a talk here. Uh, Twitter has an in-house implementation of search in Early Bird and OmniSearch. There are links to their blog posts. Airbnb has a Lucene-based internal search system. Salesforce, they started off with Oracle because they started like 1999 before MySQL was a thing. Uh, but they also, their internal search is also a custom search system. And all of these are publicly documented. So the conclusion I arrived at is even search doesn't really, even Lucene-based search doesn't really work reliably at scale. If you have a better bit of data, even Lucene-based search doesn't work well. So my other takeaway from this crude analysis is Lucene is good, because if it's not good, a lot of people won't be using Lucene as their in-house search solution. What is not so great is actually distributed Lucene implementations. And then I started looking into these, how are Lucene-based distributed 
Lucene-based implementations, how are they done? And what I've realized is all the distributed Lucene-based implementations are designed as a distributed database. Uh, and uh, historically, uh, serving a petabyte of data using distributed database has been, uh, a distributed database design has been pretty challenging in the past. Uh, and you might also think, hey, like, I'm still not convinced, right? This is probably seems like a very niche problem. But we are in the world of generative AI, and generative AI accelerates the production and consumption of data. So if you, th if you think, hey, like, petabyte scale data, I may not have it, just wait a few years, and you will have it. You know, every day you'll have a petabyte of data. And the other pattern I've noticed, uh, I'm not an ML person, but the other pattern I've noticed is most of the generative AI applications are actually built on search. Generative AI applications actually use search systems to actually get fresh and relevant data as the first step on which the magic is applied. And the other issue with generative search with existing systems is most of the existing systems are queried by humans. But once you throw machines in the mix, humans can wait, but machines can't. So latency and reliability are going to be even more important once uh, in the future of, uh, in the future. So what, how do we know that distributed databases don't scale? I went and looked at some database research, primarily column stores. Uh, so today, if you look at across uh, a large company and you say, hey, who is managing petabytes of data? The inevitable answer is all the big data teams manage petabytes of data. And for them, a petabyte of data is just Monday, right? Uh, and if you look at the history of how the, these column stores evolved to petabyte scale, uh, initially, in the 70s, it was just a, uh, analytics was just a feature of existing databases. In the 90s to 2004, people were like, okay, maybe we need separate databases for analytics use cases, right? But 2014 to 2015, 2004 to 2015 is when this thing kicked into high gear with systems like C-Stores, and uh, uh, which became Vertica, and HitStore, and all of those systems, is... Uh, column stores became distributed. They started building column stores as a distributed database, so you would put all the partitions on a hash ring and then consistently hash to them, and uh, you would do replication and whatnot, right? Uh, this scaled well uh, up to a few hundred terabytes. But around 2015, uh, there was a major shift in the architecture of columnar systems, and that is this movement towards cloud-native or disaggregated storage systems, or these days they call it serverless. Uh, and this architecture has unlocked uh, these systems to go from managing just hundreds of terabytes of data to managing petabytes of data. And my grand idea is, hey, search infrastructure has not kept it with the times. Why not just build a Lucene system uh, that has a disaggregated storage architecture so we can scale to petabyte storage systems. Uh, so we basically took the lessons from the columnar stores and applied them to a distributed, uh, to a search system like Lucene. And uh, at least before we started, uh, this kind of works anecdotally. We know that this does because of a few reasons. Uh, at, Lu at Twitter, when we built Loglens, it used to manage uh, several hundreds of terabytes of data pretty easily. Uh, there was a point where that system did not even have an owner, and it just worked. Uh, and then uh, Pinterest built Manus, which actually is a, uh, which also has a similar architecture, a disaggregated storage architecture. Uh, Amazon Product Search, which was also presented at Berlin Buzzwords, also moved towards a disaggregated uh, storage architecture for uh, managing, uh, for serving large-scale uh, workloads. So enter CalDB. Uh, this is like a super brief summary of CalDB. Uh, and what it is, CalDB is the only Lucene-based cloud-native observability database today that employs a distributed storage architecture. Uh, I, I'm going to use the words serverless or cloud-native or disaggregated storage architecture a little bit interchangeably throughout this talk, so please bear with me if I'm switching between these words. Uh, it has a very low operational overhead, and it actually runs on Kubernetes. It's designed to run on Kubernetes. Best of all, it's also open source. Uh, it implements the same API as open search, 
So it's a drop-in replacement for open search. It's designed to handle petabyte scale workloads. Uh, and it has a few new features, like uh, it handles field conflicts automatically, it prioritizes fresh data or older data, and it could be faster and in some configurations up to 10x cheaper than existing uh, implementations of open search or other systems. Uh, we have been uh, running uh, CalDB in Slack in production. Currently, I work for Airbnb, so these numbers are for from when I was at Slack and I gave a talk at Strange Loop last year. You can refer to it. But at that time, Slack was managing about a petabyte of data with seven days of retention using CalDB. The peak ingest of CalDB at that time was around 70 Mbps, and we were ingesting somewhere around seven million messages per second in that system. So uh, with the marketing or like the summary out, right? So let, let's look at CalDB and like, let's see what it does. So for, the, for this talk, I'm going to use a reference architecture of Elasticsearch so we all have a common context and you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so the Elasticsearch architecture I'm uh, using is in this picture. Uh, so there's an application. The application is producing logs. Uh, a collector collects these logs and sticks them in Kafka, right? And the typical architecture for Elk architecture is uh, you have Logstash that's consuming these logs from Kafka and then writing them to Elasticsearch. In Elasticsearch, the log stash writes to a set of stateless nodes called ES writers, which actually get all the writes, and then those nodes write the data to all the data nodes in Elasticsearch. And then on the query side, Kibana or Grafana or whoever is querying the Elasticsearch cluster, the query layer gets all the queries. It's again stateless Elasticsearch nodes. And then that data, uh, those queries fan out requests to the data nodes which serve the query and then uh, the query nodes respond to the client. Uh, all of this is orchestrated by the Elasticsearch master. So this is the architecture, reference architecture we are going to use for this talk, just so we all have context when I'm talking about Elasticsearch or its issues. So with this architecture, we ran into a few challenges. The big, there are like five broad challenges we ran into with Elasticsearch. It has high operational overload for a over overhead for us. It was not great at handling log spikes. Multi-tenancy story was not great. Uh, we had some data reliability and cost was obviously a concern. So what did we do? Uh, so the first challenge was high operational load. So in Elasticsearch, running any kind of cluster management, once you have like a few hundred nodes, is actually pretty uh, tedious, and these operations take a lot of time. For example, some operations could take anywhere from days to weeks, and uh, while these operations are running, a bigger problem is that they affect the read and write performance of all the clusters, uh, of the entire cluster. So if you're just taking down a node, only, it's not that only that node is affected. Further, Elasticsearch has several single points of failure. For example, if uh, you're doing bulk indexing, and one of the indexers is slow, the, throughput, the indexing throughput for all the indexers just goes down because everything is as slow as the slowest node. And if you have 100 or 200 nodes, uh, and that pretty much guarantees that for every request, you're hitting P99 in some server somewhere. So your ingestion throughput uh, can drastically fall in some uh, edge cases. Uh, the other issues we had uh, with Elasticsearch where its design is such that the master node is in the read and write path for most operations. So if the master node is down, we would just stop all the reads and writes of the entire cluster and recovering from it was extremely hard and like time consuming. Uh, and also this is like rare, especially within the latest versions, but with the older versions, when we started the project, uh, the, uh, there was data and metadata corruption issues and whenever Elasticsearch had an issue, we, the data and metadata corruption could basically cause data loss, where the cluster would, uh, like an entire index would just be corrupted and we couldn't recover it, and the only option to recover for was to delete the indices and things like that. Uh, so let's see how we solve these problems with CalDB. Uh, CalDB also follows the same pattern, which is you have an app that produces logs, a collector that writes the logs to Kafka, and all the blue boxes in this diagram are CalDB components. So the first processor component that picks up these logs is the preprocessor. The preprocessor ingests these logs from Kafka, formats the logs, 
uh, so that and makes them ready for ingestion. It also enforces quotas and it routes the data to specific Kafka partitions. And uh, from there on, an indexer takes over. An indexer is linked to a specific Kafka partition and it pulls the data and indexes the data into a Lucene index. The indexer periodically snapshots the data into a deep store like S3, and it also serves the queries on the data it has ingested. Uh, then we have the cache component, which downloads the snapshots uploaded by the indexer to S3. It downloads them from S3, and then it serves queries on that data. Finally, we also have the query layer, which handles the requests from the clients, and for every request, it performs a scatter gather query across the relevant indexers and cache nodes and returns the results to the client. All of this operation is orchestrated by the cluster manager, which is the brain of our system. A cluster manager uses Zookeeper as a persistent data store and a notification store. It's responsible for snapshot management, where it makes sure that all the snapshots uploaded by the indexer are served, uh, are downloaded by the cache, and they're being served. It is responsible for data lifecycle management, where uh, if some piece of data goes out of the retention window, it evicts that data from the cache and then subsequently deletes it from S3. The cluster manager is also responsible for node management operations. So if no, as nodes come and go, it assigns tasks to various nodes. So this is the disaggregated storage architecture of CalDB. This architecture helps you separate compute from storage. And more importantly, it removes the durability of data from storage. I think this is important because uh, the durability of a data in a database is typically maintained by the database. In this architecture, it's not the database that maintains the durability of the data, but if the data is unindexed, its durability is maintained by Kafka, and if it's indexed, its durability is maintained by S3. CalDB just makes sure that the data, uh, that any piece of data that was written is in one of these uh, two places. It's also horizontally scalable, so as you uh, add more nodes, you get more ingest capacity and read capacity in the system. Uh, it also, CalDB also has minimal, is designed to have minimal dependency between components. So it is designed such that if one of the components goes down, it doesn't affect the other components. For example, if one of the indexer goes down, only the consumption from that Kafka partition is down, but the other indexers are uh, going at full throttle. Similarly, if the cluster manager goes down, it does not take down the read and write paths. Yes, there are cases where you need uh, the cluster manager to be up. Those operations would fail. But in a typical read and write path, those operations uh, would still succeed even if the cluster manager is down. Uh, and as we have seen, uh, CalDB actually has a pull-based ingestion as opposed to a push-based ingestion in other systems. Push-based ingestion actually complicates a lot of search infra pipelines. It also is problematic because if your indexer is having a bad time like a GC, something as simple as a GC or a heavy read volume, if you get a heavy write volume, that puts a lot of pressure on the writes and complicates your indexing story. But if the indexer is pulling the data from Kafka, it'll actually pull it when it's happy, and if there is heavy read volume, it'll just slow down the pull and it can catch up later. Uh, and finally, we also separate indexing from serving. So technically, the indexer doesn't have to serve uh, the data it's in it. We, it can just rely on cache to do all the serving of all the queries. This way, we can separate the indexing of the data from the serving of the data in the system if we decide. So the second challenge in CalDB is handling log spikes. So what is a log spike? Log spike is nothing but uh, an increase of about 10x increase in the volume of logs uh, that are coming into the system from a storage perspective. This can happen for several reasons. The simplest reason is, oh, the application is producing a lot more logs for some unknown reason, right? Or there may be failures in the log ingestion pipeline that might be causing backups. For example, your log stash is down and you're backed up in Kafka and now you're like writing all the logs to catch up, right? That could be a spike. Uh, so why are log spikes bad? 
Because log spikes are bad because they lead to lag. Why do they lead to lag? For example, if you look at the graph here, uh, the provision capacity of the cluster is that red line, but the messages you are getting is that blue line. You can see that the, order, the, the number of messages you are getting is an order of magnitude more, at least, uh, than normal, which basically means you don't have enough capacity in your Elasticsearch cluster to ingest all those messages. When that happens, you fall behind. And when you fall behind, what ends up happening is you lose real-time visibility into your systems because you are, it's like driving your car where the speedometer is actually showing the speed from like 10 minutes ago. It's no good if you are want to like check your speed limit. So uh, the other problem we actually ran into for our use case was uh, our engineers just said that, hey, our log set system just does not have fresh data anymore. And we were curious why people said that, because our SLA showed that it wasn't great, but the number wasn't zero, right? And turns out, what happened was you would hit a log spike when there is an incident. Like, basically, whenever there is an incident, you'd get a lot of logs because there are a lot of errors, and you would hit a log spike. And whenever there is a log spike, you would not have uh, fresh data in the system. And when there is no fresh data in the system, that would always coincide with an incident, and incidents were the were most commonly the time when people needed fresh logs. So from their perspective, logs were never fresh. So we wanted to solve this problem very badly because in some of the incident reviews, it was identified that, hey, like logs being behind is what caused us to, what caused us to, uh, tr what caused the triage of this issue to go longer. You can apply uh, some techniques like rate limiting, management sampling to minimize this, but in the end, uh, the only solution to handle a log spike is to actually either add capacity, uh, is to add capacity to the system, right? So I, I just have uh, an interesting quiz question. Let's see if anyone has an answer. Uh, so does anyone know what does ES do when you add more nodes to it during a log spike? What's the first thing it does? Yes, exactly. The first thing Elasticsearch does when you actually add capacity is reallocates the shards, and that's the worst time to do it because not only you're adding capacity because there is not enough capacity, when you do add it, it's actually using that capacity to repartition the data, which is taking away, which is reducing the existing capacity in the cluster, right? So. Uh, the, the, these kind of things is what like distributed databases and the constraints that uh, come with it kind of enforce on us. So what does CalDB do? Uh, the best solution uh, in any time your logs are lagging, regardless of how you do it, is to actually prioritize ingesting fresh logs over older logs. Here is why you need this, okay? So uh, yeah, I have a log spike. And you, using your logs, you know why the issue happened, right? But uh, you fixed the issue and you made a fix. What you need to know now is whether the deploy worked or not. But you can't use your log search systems because your logs are behind. So what do you do? Uh, but, so what do you do? You just wait, right? But if you prioritize indexing fresh logs over older logs when you get a log spike, what happens is you can say, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm prioritizing indexing fresh logs, so now I get real-time visibility into the system. Yes, there is a gap in the data, but I already know what was going on there, so it's okay. Uh, so let's see how CalDB prioritizes fresh logs over older logs. Let's, uh, as we have seen in the indexer, indexer indexes the data into a Lucene indexer. It periodically takes a snapshot of the data, uploads it to a deep st store like S3, and it serves queries on the data it has. For the, and if you squint a little bit, you'll realize that indexer is actually using Kafka partition as a write-ahead log, right? Uh, but uh, let's see with an example how we prioritize fresh logs. Let's say there is a Kafka partition with 10 messages, and then the indexer is indexing the first message. Let's say something happens, and the indexer goes boom, right? Uh, because we run on Kubernetes, Kubernetes brings up a new indexer. When Kubernetes brings up a new indexer, uh, by the time more logs have come into the system, and let's say you are at 100 messages now. And at this point, the new indexer realizes that it cannot catch up. It will always be behind. Because it runs on a container with fixed resources, it knows it cannot catch up. So what does it do? 
It creates what is called a recovery task and says, hey, you know what? Some, somebody take care of this for me. You go and index from offset 1 to offset 99, OK, in Kafka. And then I'll go start indexing the fresh message. This is how CalDB prioritizes indexing fresh data over older data when it falls behind. Then CalDB, for every recovery task, spins up what is called a recovery indexer. What does the recovery indexer do? It picks up the recovery task. In this case, says that, hey, index uh, from offset 1 to 99. And that's what it does. It gets messages 1 through 99, indexes them, uploads the data to S3, and then uh, basically uh, dies. Right? And this is how CalDB, uh, using recovery indexer, is how it actually adds elastic capacity as needed to catch up. And this is how we avoid peak provisioning our clusters. Otherwise, you have to peak provision your clusters for all the log spikes, and that's expensive because most of the time you're not using the additional capacity. Uh, if you notice, we are using the same mechanism for recovering from failures to handling log spikes in the system. So the third challenge with Elasticsearch is multi-tenancy. Uh, at scale, uh, if you have large tenants, we have to run those tenants. Uh, we have to allocate separate clusters for large tenants. The reason we need to do this is because uh, the read and write patterns for large clusters, uh, if you put small tenants and large tenants together, the read and write patterns interfere with one another, and it results in poor latency, and uh, it results in poor reliability for users. So we, set, we give large tenants separate clusters. In addition, we also do separate indices for each tenant on separate, uh, even if they're on a single cluster, even if they're sharing a cluster. We also strictly enforce quotas for every tenant, so they are using their fair share of resources and not using someone else's. But this comes at a cost. We have to manage over 100 clusters at Slack just for logs, right? And this process is very tedious and error prone. Managing capacities, making sure the cluster has enough capacity, making sure all the clusters are green, making sure whatever operation you're doing is, goes to all the clusters is a very tedious and error prone process. So CalDB solves this using, by providing native multi-tenancy features. Uh, it provides true workload isolation between services without having to run separate clusters. Let's see how this works. Let's say there are two applications, yellow service and an orange service. Uh, the preprocessor takes the logs from the yellow service and writes it to Kafka partition one, and it writes the logs for orange service and writes them to Kafka partition two. Because an indexer is tied to a Kafka partition, the indexer one indexes the mess yellow messages and indexer two uh, indexes the orange messages. All the queries for the yellow messages go to indexer one, and all the queries for the orange service go to indexer two. In this system, uh, we, because all the indexers are running in multiple containers, uh, you have true resource isolation between the queries for indexer one and indexer two. And uh, this is how CalDB uh, provides true workload isolation without having to run separate services. You can just take a lot of your medium-sized services, put them all in a cluster, and then uh, allocate them this way and call it a day. And this greatly reduces cluster management overhead because you can go from tens of clusters to just like three to five. The third challenge uh, with Elasticsearch is data reliability. So one of, uh, there is this issue with Elasticsearch where it rejects messages with field conflicts. What is a field conflict? Field conflict is nothing but one developer writes a message in one place where uh, he has a field, and the field's name is user ID, and it is passed, uh, it is uh, printed, uh, sent to Elasticsearch as a number. There is another log message where the user ID is sent as a string with the same number. Because the types of these two fields are different, Elasticsearch uh, basically accepts one and rejects the other. The other th interesting thing that happens in Elasticsearch is uh, because of the ILM policies, what ends up happening is uh, every time uh, an index gets rotated, uh, because of the ILM policies, uh, the next time it happens, so let's say right now my user ID with number is getting accepted, but user ID with the string is getting rejected, 
when the index <laughs> rolls over, <laughs> the opposite might happen. So your dashboards and alerts are all over the place when this happens. And when, uh, the, this is very problematic because you, again, lose visibility into your systems. Like, you have a very important log message of all your requests. Some other developer in some part of the other code writes a small message with the field with the field conflict. Now, Elasticsearch just starts re rejecting all the important messages and they're not being indexed. So you lose your visibility into these systems very fast and it's very problematic. And it usually happens right after deploy when you need your logs uh, to tell you whether everything is going according to plan or not. And the worst part about rejecting these log messages is these issues are very hard to debug because you typically use your logging system to debug these issues, but if the logs are being dropped from the logging system, you can't use your logging system to kind of like debug this. So that's another problem. And uh, the other management aspect, kind of data reliability aspect uh, of Elasticsearch is you need to do backups for data reliability. Sometimes we see data corruption, things like that, for which we need to do data backups, which adds to infrastructure cost. So in CalDB, uh, we provide automatic field conflict resolution. So if you have two, if someone writes two fields uh, with two different types, we have different field conflict policies. One of them is we'll just convert the type of the value to the existing field type and call it a day. The other one is we convert it to an existing field type and also create a new field of the new type. Uh, this ensures there is no data loss and ingestion. It still causes other issues, but it at least helps you debug the data, understand what's going on. Uh, and also, if you noticed, CalDB does not need any backups because the indexer uploads a snapshot to S3 and cache is downloading the snapshot. So you don't need to, it's kind of like has built-in backups. Uh, and that's the mechanism it uses to basically replicate the data. So you don't need any separate backup infrastructure. So the final one is cost. Uh, and uh, CalDB can be up to 10x cheaper, depending on the configuration you're running the systems in. For example, we use tired storage that reduces the cost by a tenth. Uh, and we helps us like, retain the data for longer, like 30 days. Uh, the other thing we can do with CalDB that is uh, very valuable for log search use case at least is you can just run your log search with just one copy of the data without losing data durability. So you just, uh, and this, uh, with Elasticsearch, you at least have to run it with uh, two copies of the data, uh, which basically doubles your cost. Uh, we also have uh, only cache one day worth of data in the indexer and the cache, and the rest of the data is on S3. We do what is called on-demand snapshot hydration, where the user can say, hey, I'm actually querying beyond a day. Uh, can, I, I'm okay waiting like, you know, like five minutes or 10 minutes. Why don't you restore this data from S3? And uh, you can send that request. Uh, all of this is automated in the UI, but you can send that request to S3, and then we'll, uh, the cache store will uh, load the older data for you to access. And this helps us uh, with investigations, wherein some person might be investigating an incident from a week ago, but it's kind of hard to keep a week-long data on the cluster. So you can just like selectively uh, cache the data that's being actively queried. Uh, because we don't have to peak provision our clusters, uh, and, and CalDB supports elastic ingestion, we only need half the indexes typically compared to our workload, uh, compared to our Elasticsearch workload in this system. Uh, also, our queries are faster because we employ uh, a few tricks like parallel segment search in Lucene. Uh, there are like a couple of other uh, little things we do um, where we actually take better advantage of uh, the memory on the system. Uh, because we, we have more shared resources to work with. Uh, and uh, uh, other potential interesting opportunities uh, with CalDB are, uh, let's say you, are, uh, you have MySQL and you're uh, writing the bin logs to Debezium and Debezium is writing to Kafka. You can write your enrichment pop pipeline directly on top of Kafka and then uh, the data uh, can directly be indexed uh, from Kafka in the indexer. Uh, and you just run another Kafka job that is reading from Kafka and writing to Kafka, which makes it fit better with the existing data infra ecosystem. Uh, because we also use S3 as our primary store for data, we all, CalDB is also better for bulk or offline indexing workflows. Uh, in conclusion, uh, existing search design systems are designed as distributed databases, disaggregated storage architecture, 
uh, helps you scale to petabyte scale systems, and CalDB is a cloud native architecture for Lucene. It's open source and it's API compatible with Lucene, and as we have seen, uh, it separates uh, storage from compute, durability from storage, and query from storage. Uh, it has very low operational overhead and has new, few features like built-in backups, built-in backfilling, automatic field config resolution, et cetera. And in some configurations, it could be up to 10 times cheaper than running the existing search systems. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, my, I'm uh, Suman. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. That's the link for CalDB. We are looking for design partners and contributions uh, from the community. And uh, yeah, some uh, disclaimers from the company and open for questions. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Suman. Uh, do we have any questions for Suman? Uh, so, um, what I got from, from your talk, so it's, it's really interesting and great improvement uh, beyond Elasticsearch. Um, uh, the reason we are talking here mostly about log data, so it's append only, so you don't update data. I think most of the problems in Elasticsearch are coming from the fact that, that people are starting to update fields or whatever yeah. uh, in historical data, which must be handled by Elasticsearch, but if you have something which is append only, you can just create snapshots. This is basically uh, the, the idea behind the system. So you can't update, or do you still up allow updates? OK, great question. So we, ca we do allow updates. Like we, it's just a Lucene index, so there's nothing stopping you from doing updates. In our architecture, we haven't implemented updates because we are starting from log search perspective. We are not starting from a search perspective. But uh, we can, e uh, I mean, when you write the data to Kafka, uh, you can just add like an update to it, and it could just be an update command. There is no restrictions on updates whatsoever. Um, I saw that you used uh, Kafka partitions Is that, uh, to bind to an indexing. Um, how do you scale those partitions uh, when you want to add more indexes? So if you want to add uh, more indexes, you can just add more Kafka partitions. In Kafka partitions, it's just a number. Uh, you can just bump up the number of Kafka partitions, and then you'll just get more Kafka partitions, and then you launch an indexer. And we use Kubernetes' uh, uh, stateful set to run the indexers. So uh, if you run more indexers, it will just go to that specific Kafka partition and consume the data. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm unfamiliar with Elasticsearch, and so I was curious if you could uh, explain just a little more briefly why during a log spike it's a very bad idea to be repartitioning your data when you're spinning up new instances that I didn't quite understand. Uh, so like you, you said that like by default what happens when there's a, a load on the system and you're, you need to spin up more instances is that it starts repartitioning everything which is counterproductive. Um, could you explain why that is? Because uh, let's say the Elasticsearch cluster is provisioned with, I mean I'm just using round numbers here, let's say each node in the Elasticsearch cluster can in index 100 messages, right? Now, let's say there are 10 nodes, and now you can index 1,000 messages. And now there are, let's say, 5,000 messages coming in. Uh, you add, let's say, sorry, let's just take 2,000 nodes. So let's say you add 10 more nodes, and you can handle like the 2,000 messages, right? So at least in your mind, you're thinking, oh, I can get index, now index 2,000 messages. But what happens in practice is not that. What happens in practice, at least during these incidents, is when you add the additional nodes, uh, the, it starts moving the data right away to the new nodes. So what happens is instead of indexing 2,000 messages, your existing indexers, because they're spending some of their time copying data, your IO throughput is lower, so existing indexers are only like doing, let's say, again, like round numbers, let's say they're only doing 70 messages a second. Uh, so not only are your new indexers not online, uh, they're only doing like 70% of the work than what they were doing, which makes the problem worse. Okay, I understand now. 
Thank you. Yeah. So in, in your uh, implementation, are you doing any kind of stored search, kind of monitoring searches? Uh, what's a so like a, a, a stored query that you're running to, to check for a particular event happening? Oh, uh, no. Well, we do run like a stored query, but it doesn't run in the system. It actually runs in Grafana. So Grafana is periodically polling the system with the same query. Okay. So, so that's could, how we run alerts. So my whatnot. question is, could you make that more efficient by putting a, 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 a node between the Kafka output and the indexer mm -hmm. that yeah. has a a small index of those stored queries and does a reverse search. Yeah, we can totally yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. All right, one last question. Yeah, I was wondering if you store the raw log data along with these Lucene indexes or do you store them separately somewhere? Uh, raw log data? Like your, your input data, your raw logs, do you go do they go into the Lucene index, or do you have them some disaggregation? No. So once the data comes in, we send the, we store them to Lucene for search. Uh, but if we do need raw logs, uh, we actually have a separate pipeline that ingests them as raw logs into S3. Uh, I mean, technically, you can use the system to do that too, but we don't. So, so the indexes are only about inverted indexes. For now, yes. Okay. <laughs>